between two fifty and I'm going to be doing all of them at once. Yeah, yeah, there you go. I keep working on it. Ultimately, it's It's crooked oh, yeah. in the tri like I mean, it's, just, it's crooked, but I think it's because this is a little, you know, but it looks straight on there. Yes. See, like that's not, but it's okay. No, because it's straight on the picture. I think this is a little crooked. Good. Are you going to use the mic? Um, I would, because I think it picks up better. On there, it should be on. Everybody, thank you for coming out. It's six o'clock. I think we're going to go ahead and try to get started so that we can honor your time. Uh, we certainly appreciate your uh, taking the time to come out and engage with us in this conversation that we're trying to have in the community around our district's finances and how it all relates to our facilities uh, in the future. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Mike Zoller. Uh, Superintendent, been here eight years now, currently on my way out of the district, um, but very excited about uh, uh, turning the, the keys over to our, our, our new superintendent, Mr. David Brandt, over here. We'll be taking the keys here in a, in a few uh, short days and weeks. We've got a number of other folks in the audience that I want to make sure we introduce as well. Uh, we have uh, Terry Groden, who is the president of our school board uh, here uh, to help facilitate as well. Uh, Ms. Katie Hennis, our district treasurer, is here. Um, we have Brian Hall, a uh, school board member as well, with us. Uh, Amy Rutledge, our communications coordinator, is kind of working behind the curtain, making sure all the tech works and the like. And we've got a number of folks from uh, then Design Architecture that are here helping to facilitate uh, some of the technology and the, pr the presentation as well, the little clickers that you have. Uh, those are from TDA as well. So we have tonight with us Ryan, uh, last name Ryan? Caswell. Ryan Caswell. Cheryl Fisher uh, is an educational planner with uh, Ben Design. And we have Ty Swanson Sawyer, who's an intern with uh, Ben Design Architecture. So, anyhow, that's kind of the group, and we're live streaming this on, on Facebook, so folks that are home are able to, to watch, view, and participate as well. So uh, again, thank you for coming out tonight, and we really hope that this is more of a conversation. And you know, we're gonna be presenting some information and trying to, um, again, just try to pull all of this together, give a little bit of a, an update, and uh, show some of the history, but really, the focus is to help educate the Board of Education with um, feedback and information that they can use to make a decision about what direction to go moving forward in the future. Because these are really big uh, questions to try to get your, to get your, uh, your brain around. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. This slide here uh, just shows where uh, people can go to get uh, uh, the survey. So we're going to come back to this, but if, if you're viewing at home, we would uh, really uh, recommend that you, uh, you log into this website here and uh, 
when we get to the questions later on, the survey questions, you'll be able to, uh, to keep right up with them as well. Those members of the audience, you don't need to go here, you just have the clickers and that's all you need. We'll, Brian will explain that when we get to that part of the presentation. So, um, I want to begin with just kind of going back and just trying to give a little context for the conversation tonight. So, uh, we, we began really discussing phase two of our facilities uh, project back in 2019. We've, we've gone through phase one. Uh, the design and, and construction of the new 612 campus, we had opened that up, and then we came back and uh, we said, you know what, this is great for our middle school and high school, but we have six other elementary schools in the district that really have some of the same needs and issues that the middle school and the high school had. So uh, we re-engaged our community task force in 2019 and basically spent that entire year, February through December, November, and we, we uh, revisited all that information that we had regarding student enrollment, uh, those kinds of trends, the financial forecast situation, our building space needs, classrooms, teachers, staffing, you know, the physical uh, needs of our buildings, renovation needs, repair needs, what those estimates were. Um, we looked at building consolidation scenarios at that time. And uh, we did a number of community surveys, and we looked at you know what it might take to actually build or repair these buildings. So we had a lot of kind of planning that took place during that time. Uh, the committee developed several options that were used that we addressed all of those issues that we were looking at from all of that data, and presented these options to the Board of Education in December of 2019. The task force really had three big ideas, three recommendations. Recommendation number one was to close Spruce Primary School and then reconfigure the other five elementary schools in the district. The big idea here is we have more school space than we have student enrollment at this time. Our enrollment has been declining. That's normal. It's happening all over in Cuyahoga County. Nothing unique to North Olmsted, but you know, the size of our district has, has uh, decreased considerably since when it was booming back in the 60s and 70s. We're about half the capacity we were back then, but we still have approximately the same number of school buildings. So we've got a lot of empty space in these elementary schools. So it's just not very efficient, not very cost effective. So the recommendation is to start closing these and consolidating. Um, and then the configuration that was proposed was to make Birch in Forest, grades K through two, Chestnut would become a grades pre-K through two, our preschool would be at Chestnut, it's a little bit bigger, and then Pine and Maple would be configured to be grades three through five. So, worked out great in terms of putting those grade levels together in that way. The problem was it's created a lot of challenges with regards to transportation. Because as we're trying to even out building sizes and reduce class sizes for our teachers and our students, it would require transporting kids from one side of the district to the other side of the district. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Again, talking about transportation. So um, some students that were currently attending a primary or intermediate school, would, they were displaced and reassigned to a different school. So you may have lived very close to, you know, let's say Birch or Maple, but because of the intention to, uh, to balance out those class sizes and school enrollments, you may have had to have been transported over to Pine or Chestnut or some other school on the other side of the district. So there just really wasn't any easy way to do this and it created a lot of challenges. And we had a number of meetings and uh, there was a significant impact with transportation. Um, recommendation number two, was to build two new elementary schools. One of them being a grades pre-K through two, and the other one being a grades three through five. So both of those schools would be about 850 students apiece. And that would accommodate all the elementary children in the district. Um, you know, in considering this, the committee looked at all of these various factors. The cost of renovating versus new construction, uh, grade configurations, 
what kind of programming would, would need to take place in there, enrollment sizes, you know, square footage, um, access to transportation, roads, etc. So all of those things were taken into consideration, but we, there never really was a specific site that was determined based on this. Just two schools, uh, the committee thought that would be the optimal solution for North Olmstead. They looked at, well, what about one large school? Westlake just put in one large elementary school. For North Olmstead, the, the feeling was not really comfortable with that large of a school. Plus, there's really not a campus large enough, maybe, that that would accommodate that. But So the recommendation was two, two smaller schools, but they would be able to accommodate all of those students. The third recommendation the task force made was to uh, understanding that the district had a need uh, to just maintain the current educational operation through a, an operating levy. We're 10 plus years out now from our last operating levy. Uh, and also recognizing that we don't have the money in the general fund that could uh, build two new schools, so there would need to be a bond issue. So. The, uh, the task force recognized the need for both an operating and a bond issue to address the educational and facility needs of the district. So that was their recommendation to, for the board to consider a combined operating bond issue uh, issue on a future upcoming election ballot. The last new money issue that was passed was in November of 2010. It was a 7.9 mil operating levy. That's now over 11 years old. Uh, since that was passed. The last bond issue was November 2014. That was a 5.45 mil bond issue, which is now coming up on seven years old. So, you know, we're, uh, we've been quite uh, a number of years out since we've had any new money. Additional community engagement would be necessary to determine the feasibility of this recommendation. So, um, those were the recommendations coming out of the task force. This is, again, remember, this is December of 2019. Well, a lot has happened since December of 2019. The world's pretty much been turned upside down. Uh, in January, the Board of Education did approve the closing of Spruce Elementary School. Um, that recommendation was made, the, the board approved it. That was gonna be for the upcoming year, 2020, 2021 school year. They also approved the reconfiguring of uh, the school district boundary lines for those schools. And we were in the process of having those meetings and trying to work out the plan and the various tweaks to make it better. But at the end of the day, it was gonna be a very difficult plan to, uh, to make work for everybody. Then in March, you know, everybody's world changed with COVID. So March of 2020, the governor uh, closed all uh, K-12 schools and the Board of Education uh, rescinded the decision to close Spruce and redistrict. We just put everything on pause because we didn't really know what the future was gonna be, and we recognized that we probably need all that classroom space that we have in order to be able to socially distance and do all the things we needed to do to mitigate COVID. So we delayed all uh, potential school closings until the 2022-2023 school year. In January of 2021, and then we went through our COVID, you know, reimagining school plan and hybrid schedules and remote learning and all of that. You know, that's what we've been focused on this last year. Um, in January of this year, we have a new treasurer on board. Uh, Mrs. Hennis updated our five-year forecast, and you know, the district now is in a um, uh, a situation that's known as fiscal caution, which means that we are spending more money than what we're taking in. We're in a deficit spending mode. We've been deficit spending for a number of years now. And the reality is that's not uncommon in governmental operations, governmental entities, but you can't deficit spend forever. We're not like the federal government. We can't just print money. We can't just borrow money. We've got to balance our budgets. We've got to submit our forecast and our budget to the state of Ohio. And we've got to be fiscally responsible. So um, we are in fiscal caution, so something needs to change. Either the revenue needs to increase because our funding has been flat and actually decreasing because of a number of different uh, variables, or we have to reduce our, our operating costs. We've got to cut back on uh, services, 
programs, opportunities for kids. So, or a combination there of both. So this is what the district is rapid, grappling with right now. How do we do all of this and still you know, maintain our facilities, maintain a high quality educational program and serve our students and community? That's why we need your input and feedback. In March of 2021, this is kind of a new information that we didn't have at the time. So this is what we're trying to help educate our community in. Um, because of COVID, school districts have received additional funding from state and federal governments. A lot of the funding has come through the federal government in the, term, in, in the form of what is called ESSER funds. ESSER stands for Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief. So just this March, in March of 2021, the district was uh, informed that we are going to receive about $7.2 million in ESSER funds. This is the third round of funding. So in ESSER 1, we got um, a small amount of funding, about 700 some thousand. In ESSER 2, we got a little bit more money. I think it was three or four million dollars uh, for ESSER 2 funding. This is, in addition to that, we're now getting 7.2 million dollars on top of all of that. So the, again, this is information that the Board of Education did not know when they made the decision back in December, January, to go on this, this past May with an operating levy. The operating levy, that 8.9 mil operating levy, 8.5 mil operating levy, would have generated $7.2 million a year. Now, it's important to understand this is one-time money. Okay, this is a one-time influx of federal money, which is great. Nobody's saying, yeah, we don't want the money. We want the money, but we, we, everybody needs to recognize it's one-time money. It's not going to last forever. It's not going to bail us out of our deficit forever. But it is something that we believe can help us maybe chart our path forward. And that's why we're having this conversation. In May of 2021, we asked our interim business services director to take a look at the task force plan and to see... Um, what he thought of it, the new business, uh, or the interim business services director, is also a registered architect. So he has kind of an architect's eye that he uh, can use to make assessments on buildings, needs, facilities, space, you know, all those kinds of things. So he went back, looked at what the, the committee had, had produced, what had been submitted to the Board of Education with a fresh set of eyes, and basically, uh, he confirmed that, yeah, we're on the right track. These buildings, something needs to be done. There are roofs that need to be replaced. There are, you know, heating, ventilation, you know, systems that need to be updated. You've got cracks in your walls. You've got masonry issues. You've got windows that are falling out. All of those things are, in fact, real and need to be attended to. Um, then also in May of 2021, our operating levy uh, did fail. So we're back to square one trying to figure out what, what the next step is going to be for the Board of Education. So uh, in June, um, the Board of Education approved an early retirement incentive plan that is projected to save the district an additional $673,000 annually. So in the next five-year forecast, between the next five and eight years, this is going to save the district over $5 million which is significant because that goes back into our five-year forecast that can help, uh, you know, keep the district, you know, running, keep, keep all of our programs and those kinds of things, you know, operational. And it's a significant way the district is going to save some money. So that's, you know, something we want the public and the community to understand why the Board of Education did that. This is a snapshot of our five-year forecast. Um, what you see here is... Um, this is our beginning cash balance for each year. So this is the fiscal year 2021. We're just finishing this up. We had $16 million uh, beginning the year. And you can see as you go out over time, that number decreases. So by the year 2025, we are going to be $5.3 million in the red. All of these red numbers are bad. Again, when we're talking accounting, Red is bad, black is good. So a lot of red numbers on here means there's a lot of 
deficit numbers in our five-year forecast. Um, this line here represents our revenue surplus or deficit. So this is kind of the deficit spending line. So this, this shows that the district has been deficit spending, you know, uh, this year, previous years, and that'll continue to get bigger as you go out over time. Cannot deficit spend forever. Something needs to be done. You see, fiscal year 2025 is when the district really um, starts running out of money and we have ending uh, cash balances that get into the negative. So really, you know, we're in 2021, we're actually now getting into 2022 now. We don't have a lot of time to change this picture. So that's why the planning, that's why these conversations are happening right now. So um, what are we gonna do? <clears throat> that's why we need your help. The game changer in all of this conversation has been these ESSER funds, which the district didn't know about. We didn't know we were gonna get an additional $7.2 million. Um, we didn't know how much we were going to get. We didn't know when we were going to get it. We didn't know how that money was supposed to be used. The good news, with in addition to the amount of money, is that the district has a lot of flexibility in terms of how this money is spent. Only 20% of those of that 7.2 million dollars is designated to be required to be spent on. Uh, recovery learning for students, uh, student learning, supports, things like that. The other 80% is very flexible. So there's some opportunities the district has in terms of how we can maybe use that money best um, to support our district operation right now. So we're trying to figure that out. Now, what we know, um, you know, the, the district's buildings still have significant <coughs> capital needs. Nothing has changed there. Uh, if we close some buildings, renovations are still going to be needed in those remaining buildings, whether we close one elementary school or two, the, the remaining four or five schools um, are going to need some kind of repair. We can't just put all those kids in there and, uh, and everything just goes on you know, without, without any uh, additional change. There's still going to be maintenance, there's going to be upkeep, there's going to be cost involved in that. Our general fund balance and the PI fund do not have enough money in the balances to make the necessary renovations. That's part of our fundamental problem. Our building needs have been siphoning off money from the general fund just to keep these buildings in, in, in play. Um, so that's been the nature of the district for a number of years. We can do that with small things, but we can't do that with big things. Um, the ESSER funding is one-time funding that can allow for some building renovations and or supplanting the general fund that but cannot fully support both. But we've got some flexibility here. So that's what we're, we're trying to think through of how we could use those funds to maybe get both of our needs, our operational needs as well as our capital improvement needs. So in terms of the ESSER funding timeline, uh, again, this is, I kind of alluded to this, ESSER 1 uh, funding, which was also called the CARES, uh, was released in March of 2020, right when COVID hit. Uh, that amount was about $789,000, um, so we received that. ESSER 2 funding came out later that year. We got about $3.2 million in those funds. Those funds are available to, uh, to be used until September of 2023. And now we've just received these ESSER 3 funds. They were released March 11th of this, this past year, spring. And uh, the amount there, the total amount, is the $7.2 million right here. And this funding is available till September of 2024. So we've got a few years where this money is going to be in play. That's really good news um, because it gives us some, some flexibility maybe to look at some options. So with that new information, our treasurer went back and ran some scenarios for us. So what this scenario is looking at, it's looking at if we took uh, the ESSER funds and my clicker, there it is. Um, we took those ESSER funds that the district is going to be receiving and we 
uh, added in a five mil operating levy. We lowered the millage amount from 8.5 to five. And then we added in a three mil bond issue, which would be enough to build two new schools. So this would be an eight mil combined operating levy bond issue, what that would do for the district. Well, um, it, does, it helps out our five year forecast here. Um, you know, it doesn't totally take away all these red numbers, but it makes them smaller. We're still, you know, we're still deficit spending here. You know, we're still gonna run out of cash in 2025, but it would get us two new schools. It would take away all of our facility needs for the foreseeable future. So you're getting, you're getting additional operating help, support to keep our educational programs, you know, online and in play, but you're also getting two new schools that are gonna take away all of these facility needs that are draining our general fund right now. So that's kind of the, the big idea, the value in this uh, scenario. So the question is, why is it so important that we address facilities and operating needs at the same time? Well, uh, ESSER funds can be used to, to supplant, we can use that 7.2 million, it's actually a little bit less, about 5 million, to supplant the general fund and keep our operation going for the next couple of years while, let's say, if this were to be successful and pass, while those two new schools are being built. So it, it moves us out a number of years, keeps us fiscally solvent, and takes away all of our facility needs. So that's, that's the big you know, value of this plan. It allows the district to do a combined operating levy with a smaller amount and a bond request. So people that came back and saw the 8.5 mil levy and they said, no, that's too much money for just operations, but they would maybe come back next time and say, well, it's a lower amount Plus, I'm going to get two new schools out of it. We think that makes a lot of sense. It's something that maybe the community might support. Um, it addresses the district's facility needs long term by providing two new efficient school buildings because the renovations are a temporary short term fix, the same problem we had with the old middle school. How long are we going to continue to sink money into that building? We know at some point it's, it's going to be obsolete. And you know, we sunk a lot of money into that building, quite honestly. We did a lot of roof repair, we did a lot of, of uh, you know, plumbing and, and heating and those types of things. Uh, uh, you know, parking lots and, and roadway, all of those types of things was money that was invested in that building that didn't see a very long-term life. Um, is the best use of taxpayer dollars renovations or is it new construction? Um, the district already has a maintenance fund, which can be used for the campus and the new buildings if passed. When we built the new campus, we had to, to include a half a mil into that project that gets set aside and is designated solely for the permanent improvement needs of the new campus. So right now, obviously, it's a new building. It doesn't need a new roof. It doesn't need new infrastructural needs. There's money accumulating in that account. Every year, five mils. You know, is is uh, you know what is that about four four hundred thousand dollars? So that's what about five a half a mil equates in our um, community. So there's about four hundred thousand dollars every year that is accumulating. So over time, that's going to build up, build up. Twenty years from now, there'll be money in there that can take care of a new roof if we need money. That also can be used for the two new schools. So we won't need an additional half mil uh, for the the new schools. It can be lumped into that half mil account we have already in play from our new campus. This would then allow the rest of our permanent improvement account for the district to use for things like technology, transportation, um, you know, more educational type of improvements for the district as opposed to just going in for, you know, roofs and windows and things like that. So. Um, you know, that account right now is being depleted solely by, you know, we get about 800 and some thousand dollars in that a year. It's approximately what that account, um, you know, uh, contains with the, the one mil. And actually, it's a half one, I think it was about 1.4 mils. Katie, what, how much, what is our PI uh, leverage? Um, 1.75. 1.75. 
1.75 mils. So half of that is already taken out. So we're left with about 1.2 mils, which you know brings in about a million dollars a year. To do a, a, a portion of one roof on one of our buildings is about a million dollars. So that's not even the entire roof. You know, we did we did a roof uh, at Maple, we did a roof at Chestnut, a portion of the roof, and it's like 800 to a million dollars for a portion of the roof. So it, it basically, you know, it takes all that account just for those types of issues. So it's not enough money. So those are why this is an important consideration at this time. So what about renovation versus new construction costs? Well, you know, um, our studies have shown that renovations or repairs, these are based on the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission. They ran the numbers, they updated, these are updated numbers, that it's gonna take about $45.8 million to renovate our six remaining elementary schools and bring them up to modern day standards. Or, if we built two new elementary schools, it would cost about $55 million just to build two new schools. So the question is, you know, which one of these, you know, is the most cost effective, you know, efficient way to address our facility needs? Um, so even these costs up here, the cost for renovation, you see the, uh, the note there, they don't include like putting up walls and reconfiguring the spaces inside to make them into more functional classrooms. That's just attending to the, the exterior of the building, the building proper infrastructure. So the district is considering a combined operating levy slash bond issue for the May 2020 ballot. Um, this again goes back to recommendation number three from the community task force. Um, and I reviewed this with you, you know, uh, earlier. This is basically their recommendation. We put it on pause because of COVID. But now with the ESSER funds kind of coming back around, looks like this is a possibility. It seems like this is feasible now because we didn't have the ESSER funds before. So this is why this is a question we want to get your feedback. This is why we're having these conversations. So we want to hear from you. And there'll be an opportunity to ask questions when we get to our survey, uh, a couple survey questions here. But uh, for those of you that are uh, viewing the, uh, the meeting live tonight through Facebook, we want you to go to this, uh, to this website, to this link, and uh, get access to uh, the poll. And we want you to participate. Uh, for those of you that are in the audience, you have your clickers, and I'm going to ask Ryan if you'd come up and maybe take us through this next uh, phase of the uh, program. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zala. So what we're going to do here um, live, all of you have your clickers, and we're just going to run through a couple multiple choice questions that relate to the things that Dr. Zaylor was just talking about. Um, so we'll ask, it's an anonymous poll, so we can't figure out you know, who's saying what for when. Um, but we'll ask you to go through, there's gonna be a series of multiple choice questions, and then again with your clickers, it's just one through four or one through three, depending on what answers we have here on the screen. I think the link is also available for those who are viewing online on the district's Facebook channel. You can go there, there's a little login address, again, Eagles, sign that in, uh, or click on the link, and then it'll take you into the survey to go ahead with that. So we will go ahead and open the polling. We ask that you do try to you do answer all of the questions as we go through. So just whatever comes to mind, answer that, and then we're going to move on. And we'll see the results not only from us who are here in person, but kind of an aggregate of those who are online submitting the polls as well. So for that, with the first question, we're just going to calibrate here and uh, <coughs> make sure that everything is working both online and then here in person. We're all in Northeast Ohio, so we get all four seasons. So go ahead and let us know, what is your favorite season? Spring, summer, autumn, or winter? You can go ahead and push one through four, depending on your answer. And you, you can push it 100 times, it's only going to log your last answer. So, you can't bump it up for autumn or, or winter, because I know everyone loves to shovel snow. And then we're just going to make sure that everything is going through all right with the system before we go on to the other questions. 
So give it a firm press, one through four. We'll make sure that we see that. Let's do that one more time, try it again. <laughs> So maybe with each question, we'll just push it a couple times just to make sure it goes through. And everyone should see a little light kind of light up when you're pushing the button on your clicker. <laughs> Did you all vote? Yep. Okay. 75. Okay. You broke it then. Oh, no. All right, well, what we'll do, um, let's go ahead and, because it looks like some of them are maybe not going through, so we're gonna replace and hand out a couple extras that are here on this table. So go ahead and um, we can take these. Very good, very good. We wanna make sure everyone's counted. Yes, we do wanna make sure everyone's counted. So when we push the button, we should see it light up on the bottom kind of on the, or the top screen, so. All that in the background, but we'll keep moving. Everyone likes autumn. Okay. 67%. That's right. That's right. Back to school. Get in there. All right. We're going to move on through the rest of the questions. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Well, what we're going to do very quickly, just to make sure we capture this, we're going to hit back. Um, try that again. Everyone, yep. It's a red circle. Yeah, not a red circle. Yeah. Oh, come on. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. One moment. All right, try one more time. Yep. I know. Well, I was. <laughs> All right. Okay. In the back? Do you want to raise hands for the people for the next question so you can tap me with their name? We can do that. Um, unless you want to remain anonymous. Yeah. I'll they could also use your vote on the flip side. Okay. Okay. Well, just try it, see if it should sure. register yep. the next time. And then yep, let's try that. All right. There's summer or spring. All right, so we'll take it up with the first question. We'll give it a shot here. The survey question number one is, one idea being considered is a plan to replace the six intermediate and primary schools and build two new ones. There would be one building for all the intermediate school students and another building for all the primary school students. The plan would likely be funded by a combined $55 million 37, three mil bond issue, and a five mil continuing operating levy. Generally speaking, do you support or oppose this plan? 
And there are options one through three, so A, B, or C. Looks like there are two that we're still missing. Maybe everyone can try and push it one more time. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I think it's still missing some. Um, so we can either do a raise of hands here and log it manually, um, unless if we're comfortable with that. Okay. All right. So who's in support of, of A? So supporting the levy. Is everybody comfortable? Yeah. Is that, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. That's sorry. Okay. <clears throat> so in support, who are opposed? And then unsure. For the second question, if you learned that this plan would allow more educational programs and opportunities since students and teachers in the same grades would be together in the same buildings, rather than being spread out over multiple buildings, would you be more or less likely to support this plan or would it make no difference in your opinion? For A, who would say more likely? Three. Less likely, no difference, or unsure. Some of them went through. Number three, if you learned that this plan will eliminate the need to shift increasing amounts of money from the classrooms and education budget to keep the buildings operational, would you be more or less likely to support this plan, or would it make no difference in your opinion? A, more likely. B, less likely. C, no difference. Or D, unsure. Survey question four, if you learned that because of their conditions over time, it will be less expensive to replace the intermediate and primary school buildings rather than continuing to repair them, would you be more or less likely to support this plan or would it make no difference in your opinion? So A, more likely. B, less likely. C, no difference. Or D, unsure. Right? And now the final question. If you learn that this plan will prevent many cuts or reductions from being made, so the school district can continue to offer academic programs, teacher ratios, and the quality of education people have come to expect in North Olmsted, would you be more or less likely to support this plan, or would it make no difference in your opinion? A, more likely. B, less likely. C, no difference. Or D, unsure. All right. Well, we appreciate those responses, and at this point, we'll turn it back over to Dr. Zala. Thank you, Ryan. Just so you know, the district is also in the process of conducting a community survey. So those are some of the questions that are going to be used in our survey that's going out to uh, registered voters in the city of North Olmsted. So there, there are more questions that will be in that survey than what you just answered those five. But we're trying to do as much as we can to solicit information, feedback, 
and, and get your thoughts and ideas on this. So thanks for uh, participating in that, uh, that little survey here with us. So we know that there are a lot of questions that people are going to have, and this is going to take a lot of education um, in terms of you know, educating the community. But we know a couple of you know, general questions that I'm sure is on everybody's mind that I just want to kind of run through right now before I get to your questions. Uh, will the district still close a school or schools? Well, the district is still planning to close one or more elementary schools effective for the 2022-2023 school year. Um, however, if a bond issue uh, were to be passed to build two new elementary schools, this decision would likely be revisited, um, and a plan would be developed to accommodate the teaching and learning needs of the district until construction is complete. Again, we don't know if, if, if the community were, uh, or the district were to move forward with two new schools, we don't know where those schools are going to be, we don't know what other schools are going to need to be online, how we would facilitate that kind of project plan, so we would have to revisit closing schools at this time and then develop a plan. How will a new superintendent, Mr. Brand, uh, impact this decision? New superintendent will have the opportunity to review the previous facility studies conducted by the district and make his own determination on recommending a path forward. Uh, the fundamental issues, however, that are being addressed, including finances, facilities, and the future impact of the North Oakland City Schools will not change. Five-year forecast isn't going to change just because the new superintendent's coming in. Those six elementary schools aren't going to get any better or, you know, just because the new superintendent so he's going to have to look at all that information, work with the Board of Education, come up with a plan. Why new buildings versus renovating our current buildings? Well, if you look on the left-hand side, uh, renovations, they're a temporary solution. It's a band-aid approach. We did that with the middle school for how many decades before we replaced it. Um, you know, the classrooms are undersized. Renovating is less efficient. Utilities are still going to be old. Um, the flexibility in these old schools, you can see, we're having, I think the technology that we're having is related to the, the, the structure here. It's just hard for technology to work in these buildings. Uh, it's costly. Uh, you still have old buildings at the end of the day. Um, they're unable to support technology and uh, those types of things. So those are all, that, those, that's the reality of renovating. New construction, on the other, other hand, is a long-term solution. It supports 21st century teaching and learning. It's more efficient in terms of our operation. We can centralize our school buildings in kind of one part of the district, more operationally efficient. Uh, gives us the opportunity to have flexible learning spaces. Um, we believe it's a good, a better use of taxpayer dollars, supports our learning needs of our students and modern technology. Where would the new schools be built? Well, the location of the new school is something that would need to be determined by the architect. You know, feasibility study, site plans, all those types of things. The district has several school properties uh, that could be used for new construction. There are a number of factors that need to be taken into consideration, including the size of the property, the geographic proximity to the district, uh, and access to, to transportation. One possibility is the site where Pine Intermediate School is currently located. It's centrally located. It's our, kind of one of our largest, um, uh, you know, green space areas, site locations. So that's one possibility that I'm sure will be looked at. When would the new school be completed? If new construction, or new construction takes approximately three years to complete from the time that a bond issue is passed to where the new school would open. So we're looking at, if it were to pass in May of 2022, we'd be looking at opening up in the fall of 2025. So it's about a three year process. About a year to plan, about two years for actual construction. How much would the new school potentially cost? The new cost of new construction would vary depending upon the design of the plan. If it is estimated that a new school would cost around $55 million. You remember the new high school and middle school combined was about $80 million. So $55 million for two smaller schools seems about 
seems about right, and our architects have given us that's a pretty good ballpark, but we would need to do some additional research and study on that. What has the district done to save money? Well, again, I, I share this slide a lot in presentations. We've really not hired staff in, in the last 10 years uh, or more. Uh, we're down 69 staff members from when I, when I came into the district. So when somebody resigns or retires, we don't just replace that person automatically. We look to see if that's a position that we can absorb. Can we restructure it? Can we you know, uh, take a look at what we could do to not have to fill that position directly? Um, we can only do that for so long. We're already seeing the impacts of that in our early primary grade levels where our class sizes are larger than what we'd like them to be. So we can't continue to not replace our teachers and our staff members when they retire. There is a um, kind of a law, a critical mass, that we're, we're at that point right now. Uh, we've been good fiscal stewards. We've refinanced the, uh, the debt on our bonds already, the interest. Saved the, the district uh, about $4 million, I want to say. Um, that, is gonna, that is going to decrease the number of years the district has to pay on those bonds. So we've shaved about three or four years off of that already. We'll continue to refinance those bonds when it makes sense in terms of when the markets say it makes the most sense. Right now, not a good time to be refinancing those types of bonds. Uh, we uh, talked about the early retirement incentive plan that's going to save the district about $5 million in the next five to eight years. Uh, we've done a, not a lot of operational changes. Uh, we closed Butternut Primary, which is saving the district about $400,000 a year, even though it's still being occupied by our administrative uh, functions. We still are no longer paying for that additional principal, the additional secretary, the additional custodians, all of those staff members that, that were previously working there. Um, so it, it's, it's been a cost savings to the district. We've looked at our transportation routes. Uh, we've fine-tuned those. We've refined them, saving about $100,000 additionally annually. We've reduced our supply budgets uh, on percentage, and we continue to look at how we can eliminate waste in all areas of operation. Why are the current elementary schools in such poor condition? Our elementary buildings range in age from 50 years to 65 years. That's just, that's just the nature of buildings. They get old, and when they get old, these kinds of things happen. You see the, the poor roof conditions. You see the masonry cracking in the walls that need to be attended to. The parking lots in some of our elementary schools, you know that those are, um, it can be hazardous at times even. Uh, heating and ventilation systems, masonry work I've talked about, the technology needs of the district. It's just, it's just a function of the buildings are getting old over time and uh, they don't fix themselves. Unless we do something about it, um, they're, they're going to continue to fall into disrepair. So, what are your questions? That's kind of what we wanted, the information we wanted to present to you, the community tonight. Um, there is an email address for those uh, community members that are viewing at home. We would encourage you that if you have not already, if you have a question, please submit that to the, uh, the email address um, that is uh, provided there. And then for those of you that are here physically uh, in the audience tonight, uh, we'd be happy to respond to your questions at this time. Yeah, Tim. Is the cost savings on the health care rolled into the simulation of the new five-year forecast? The cost savings? On the health care incentive? Is that, is that, okay, that was rolled into your simulation? Mm -hmm. Which we are fortunate that we've been able to, um, uh, to estimate a smaller percentage of those increases than than previously were forecasted in the future. So we've done a nice job of, of kind of reining in some of those costs that continue to rise year after year. But again, that's a very small percentage of the overall you know, general fund budget. But, so would you look then in, in 26 or 27 based on the five-year forecast to look for another operating based on that five-year forecast? We would need one at that time. This this scenario would just get us through. It'd get us to even. Get us to 2025, where we get into those two new buildings, and then we'd still. Then we just. The good news is, we just would be focusing on operating costs at that time. Right. 
All of the facility needs would be attended to. We would have our permanent improvement fund. We would be flush with the ability to attend to some educational needs like technology, replacement, upgrades, um, bus transportation, those kinds of things. It all would have an opportunity to, um, to provide those things without drawing away from the general fund. Would, would you repurpose these buildings or would that, would that bond issue include demo of the, the current buildings? Yeah, that's, that's something that we would need to be determined. I mean, yeah. the most likely scenario would be that, you know, we, we're required as a district to, um, to offer these right. school buildings that are not being used anymore to charter schools. Right. So that would be an option. I don't think, I mean, my, you know, we've had some, we've, we have one charter school in North Olmstead, mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't seem to be interested. Right. Depending upon how legislation, you know, shifts at the state level, there may be the possibility to have to talk to outside yeah. charter schools that are outside of North Olmsted. But I think when they see what, what we're showing you here, the needs, the upkeep, what's going to cost to, to invest in those buildings, most likely we're thinking probably not interested. So demolition is a real possibility. And there's also some other scenarios where we could maybe partner with the city and, and okay. work with them on some things. But that would not be in the initial cost of the of the, the three three mil bond. Well, I don't know. We'd have to probably include that in there. It, it does. The facilities commission requires us to demolish the buildings and have them set aside for that. Okay. So um, so that be so that three mills would include not only the cost of the new construction but demolition. And the only reason I'm asking because yeah. in my current district, I got stuck with a project that wasn't. Yeah. From a so I just, that's why I was asking. Was it a was it a Ohio facilities construction? It was. was. That's why I so that's why I was asking okay. it. So because that can be costly to a district. Absolutely. After after the completion it's of hundreds the of thousands of dollars. It, it, it absolutely <laughs> yeah. is. Yeah. So it costs a lot of money to tear one of these schools down right. because of asbestos abatement and yeah. all kinds of things that are you know included in these uh, old school buildings. Uh, while we're talking about the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission. It's important to note that the district would need to partner with them in this scenario because right now we've already got a, a big bond issue that we're paying on. We've got a lot of debt for the new campus. So the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission would help us work through and get us some waivers and overrides so that we could borrow you know, the money to do these, this other project. So um, that's very helpful. The other good piece out of that is that we get reimbursement back from the state by partnering with them. And right now, our reimbursement is 18%. So approximately 20% of the cost of this would be paid for by the state. So that's going to lower the millage amount for the local community in terms of what would be required for the bond issue. So that's, that's a good thing. So would you offset, would you lower the bond, would you lower the millage, the millage. of the bond and increase the operating? Um, or that's still undetermined. Yeah, I mean, I think we're right now we're we're looking at that five mil operating, okay. three mil bond issue is kind of the, As your best the sweet spot. Okay. Yeah, but uh, but you know that eighteen percent has increased since from since when we built the new campus. We were like twelve percent at that sure. time. So uh, some additional state money coming into the community, which is uh, it's always a good thing. Other questions. Um, Katie, I, I guess, you know, if you just go back to look at what the 8.5 mil cost was back in the May election, so we're looking at 8 mils, so it's going to be kind of in that neighborhood. I don't know, Katie, do you have those numbers? Um, if it was the 8 mils, it would be 279 dollars a year. So how much would that be monthly? It would be Yeah, I mean, it's not insignificant, but when you consider you're still maintaining the operational and educational quality of the district with our operating you know, component, plus you're getting two new elementary schools, which would then make our entire district essentially have brand new state-of-the-art schools and all of our facility needs, these kind of conversations that we've been having for years and years would, would 
be totally shifted to just operating uh, for, the, for the, the future. I mean, for all of our lifetimes, uh, certainly. Um, we think, you know, the board thinks that's something that should be considered by the community. At least know that this is a, a feasible option. And then because of those extra $3, this might be a window of opportunity to maybe take care of all of this at one time. How long, how long would that include the $278 a year? Continue. Continue. It's, it'd be continuing. Every year. Yep, every year. Right. Yep. With no ending? No. How many years? Well, just well, the the operating part of that would be ongoing. Yeah. The bond would be what thirty seven years, I think, is. Yeah. So you would probably see that after thirty seven years. I'm sure it, it'll be less than that because there will be refinancing and there'll be years shaved off. But it'll be approximately thirty years of what typical cost would be. Then that'll drop off. The bond, the bond part of that tax increase will drop off after that time. But the, the operating costs will be continuing in our day. Yeah. And that's just, you know, thanks to the way schools are funded in the state of Ohio. That's all I can say. You know, it's been found unconstitutional four times, the DeRolf issue. You know, I talked to on you know blue and face about it, but uh, that's the way schools are funded in Ohio. I don't have a question. It's more of a comment sure. more about the, the transportation piece. I think when you're look I think the I think the idea of Two new buildings is it, it makes a lot of sense. I think when you're looking at let's say just a pre-K through two, and then a three through five on let's just say you know, use the Chestnut campus and then say the Pine campus. I think when you're looking at two different campuses for two different grade levels, let's say I got a second grader and a third grader, and I don't, but I think when you're looking at if I have that in my house, you know, two kids, two different grade levels, different sides of the of the city, and if I'm a parent that picks up or drops off, I think I think that might be a consideration, and that might be something you want to think about. And again, I'm just I'm just thinking outside the box here. That might be difficult for parents that either drop off or pick up, or grandparents or family members that drop off or pick up, or if you get kids on the bus. You know, having a kindergartner going across one side of the the, the city, but my, my third. so so, and I and I know it's a it's the the pre K through five campus is sometimes a different dynamic, but it, it may be a it may be a selling point in a community where where it, it's almost that homeschool that that neighborhood type of campus where where if if I'm on one side of the city. I, I get to at least have my kids, if I'm a, if I have a second grader and a fourth grader, I know that at least they're going to be in the same building at least through fifth grade, same pickup times, same drop off times, same bus routes, and, and that may be a benefit to the district from a transportation standpoint. Absolutely. So just it, it, it's not really quite. It, mm -hmm. It's just more of a, a. And again, I know that that does things with the the dynamic of the the design of the building and things like that. But that may help in some of the promotion of the of the of the the building project. Absolutely. Because when, when you go out to sell this to the community, because if I had a, a second grader and a, a fourth grader, yeah. I would be concerned if I had a sh if, if I'm on. This side of the the city, and I gotta go. All, I gotta send them all the way over to Chestnut. Let's just say at eight o'clock in the morning. But my other one has to get up. You know, it just Absolutely. it becomes different. Absolutely. Or maybe it would be nice as a community member for them to offer before school, after school care that we have not had in years. You know, mm -hmm. like people who have to. That are traveling that distance, at least okay, they can wait. You're not speeding from one end to the other to get them. Yeah. But we haven't had after school care for I've ever heard that. He's right here. Yeah. So I, that's I, a huge one. Yeah. I, so I, I think the I think I, I think you and I have talked about it in the past. I think the you, the two the two new buildings make sense from a you know operational and money, but but I also think there's got to be some consideration of 
of what the parent and the family and, and, and the, that fi family dynamic goes through mm -hmm. from a day-to-day -day perspective of what the, what the logistics of what that looks like, you know, and, and so that might be something you want to yeah. survey your committee and, and about to say, is that possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had a similar conversation when we were talking about the high school, middle school, right. you know, in separate kind of building locations, and you know, the idea came back, and really, um, a lot of what drove that building design concept was the reimbursement money we got back from the state, because if those two buildings were connected, they're separate buildings, they're designed to be separate schools, but they're under one roof, so they're connected, we got the full reimbursement from the state, similar concept, could be applied to two buildings, a pre-K two and three through five on one campus, kind of like the high school, middle school, much smaller, but kind of connected under one roof, and you get the same kind of economies of scale and those those you know benefits for from a parental perspective, you know, by just the design and location of the building. So I think those are all the kind of conversations, and that's the kind of feedback the district is going to need before school care, after school care, you know, how can we wrap that all into maybe, you know, a package that's gonna work for our, our students and our parents. And it's one less, it's one less transition for, for kids. Absolutely. You know, I don't, I, I don't have to transition from second to third grade and then from fifth grade to sixth grade and then from eighth grade to ninth grade. Absolutely. Now I just gotta go from five to six, eight to nine. Yep. You know, and, and we as adults may not think that's a big deal, but it's but, a big deal. But it's a, it's but a it's big a, deal. But it's a big deal. We know it's, it's, it's educators. We know it's a big it's deal a because deal. there's always like an implementation dip anytime you have a change like that. Yeah. And uh, that transition, those are critical transitions. We know educationally, going from eighth grade to ninth grade, that ninth grade year is probably the toughest year in high school. Right. You know, it's just a big change. And so, to the extent that we can minimize those changes, that's going to help our overall. Education. And I, and I can only imagine when you when you when you rolled out the redistricting redistricting with the transportation, you probably got a lot of emails and phone calls. There's just no efficient way to do it. Right, and it's just imbalance. Right, just imbalance. And so I think I think looking at the looking at the city from from east and west perspective may help you with some of that public perception. That's just those are great my, points. Yeah, my, that's just my perspective. Yep, on no, things. great points, and, and those are all the kinds of things that are going to have to be part of that conversation and, and thinking and designing process. Yeah, Tim. So, are, are you saying that instead of an eight point five mil, you might just do a three mil with an additional mil in a couple of years? This would be a combined uh, operating and bond issue. So there'd be a three mil bond issue to build the schools with a five mil operating to keep the, the, the operation moving to cover the cost while the construction of, the, of those schools is being built. So it'd be less than what the eight five was back in May, but you're gonna get two new schools out of it and it's gonna take us out through 2025. After that time, then we're still looking at operating, you know, um, costs and, and how to maintain the operations going forward. But you take the facility needs off the table. So that's kind of the idea behind this scenario, the combined operating bond issue levy. Um, it attends to all of our facility needs for the future. So but there still would be five mils of operating included. Okay, so if I hear you correctly, we're looking at 8.5. Possibly. Is it possibly. Possibly. Enough. Yes. And about $25 a month for $100,000 of value. Approximately. Yep. And then in 2025, we would have to get another? There, be, there would be the need at that time for another operating levy of some sort. Now, you're also going to see in the course of those years, when those new buildings come online, you're going to see a lot of additional operational costs, efficiencies, that are going to lower some of our costs in the district um, that are going to help out that five-year forecast. You're going, to have, you're going to have, you're not going to have as many principles as what you need now if you have two buildings versus six buildings. You're not going to have as many, you know, our teaching staff, you're going to be more efficient because we're not going to have, 
you know, large class sizes on one district and small class sizes on the other side of the district. You're going to be able to kind of get much more efficient with all of those educational and operational costs. The cost to transport food to all these buildings, all of those things. It's going to help bring those costs down considerably. So that'll help going forward. For, for me, I like to keep the emotional aspect out of it and mm -hmm. talk more of the money part mm -hmm. so that we understand what commitment as a taxpayer and homeowners were committing to. Absolutely. And obviously, it's nice to hear you saying that, but we're not seeing any numbers as far as, well, if we do this, then in five years from now, we'll have a reduction because no less principles, less this or less that. I mean, so far, that's not in your presentations at all to help us feel more comfortable with the fact that, I mean, right now, for the 30 years I've lived here, we've gone up 300% on property taxes, and you're asking for another $50 a month, which is a lot, considering what we're paying already. So then, then I'm hearing you saying in five more years, we're going to be asked for even money again for another operating levy. So from leaving the emotional aspect about the beauty of the schools and that, I would just like to see if we can focus some part of it where it's just numbers. It's yeah, I, I think in numbers. future in future presentations, those will be part of those presentations. The purpose of tonight's meeting is just to begin a conversation around this idea. Because right now, what the board is deliberating on, we just had an operating levy fail in, in May, and there's a very short window of time before that they have to meet if they're going to put another operating levy on in November. So those decisions have to be made this summer. So the question that they're wrestling with is, because the financial forecast isn't going to change unless we have a dramatic decrease in, in our costs, we bring that operating cost side of the equation down, which is going to mean there's going to be a reduction in, in staff, a reduction in services, a reduction in opportunities for kids. That's the only way that line is going to come down and get back in parallel with our revenue line. So the question is, do we want to just focus on that and then just keep siphoning money off into these old buildings, which is one option, or do we want to take advantage of those ESSER three dollars that came in this spring that the board didn't know about until March and see if there's a window of opportunity here to maybe kind of kill two birds with one stone, take care of it all, at least right now, not permanently. There's never a permanent solution to school funding in the state of Ohio. There's always a three to five year cycle that is going to need to be attended to. But the question is, if those were the two options for the board to consider, which one makes the most sense? Do you just go back on for operating? Or do you maybe take you know, a look at a combined operating bond issue that gets you through the facilities questions and then gets you through the building of those new buildings, get you out to 2025, and then you're, you know, you're back to the, the standard conversation in the state of Ohio about operating. Well, and let's also be fair that the, the high taxes in this city are just not reflective of the, the school district. The high taxes in this city are also reflective of the city of North Olmstead, which is a separate entity of the city of the school district. So. Those are two. Those are two separate conversations, also. So, high taxes in this city are just not reflective of the school district. And you could even extrapolate that out to kind of the county. That is a correct statement. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's our county is unique. So, so North Olmsted State Schools are not the the sole bearer of the high taxes in this city. So, but that's a good question, Tim. And I think you know, again, we don't have those numbers tonight because we're just trying to get the big idea get feedback on that. We're doing a community survey, get some more feedback from the community so the board has some information, you know, that they can base a decision on because by the end of June, you know, getting into July, the timeline, I mean, they've got to have a decision by August and two resolutions have to be passed if they are going to move forward with something for November. So if they're not going to go for November, there's much more time to have those kind of answers that you're looking for for May of 2022. Well, I mean, for me personally, I, I like the idea of using time as an overall community center of North Homestead. Westlake did it. So to me, I like the idea of just using the time property to encompass six or K to five. However, it's 
seems like through the conversation, there's still so many open variables <coughs> from the dollar amount that makes me more nervous. The fact that that's why keeping the emotional and the numbers totally separate is I love the idea of saying Pine is going to have a K to five. I think we should keep the old Pine building, renovate it, focus on something else that might be cheaper. But for having kids that might be more uh, higher on the education level, just going from Pine to the high school that short strip down Dover is a beautiful idea mm -hmm. uh, as far as transportation. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I still don't hear a lot of definite numbers. A lot of times we're still talking about this or possibly that or we're not sure. And for me, that's what scares me is the fact that from the, from the emotional standpoint, yes, I think it would be great that but from the dollar amounts I still don't really hear that we're very definitive like this is this is this is what we want here's the picture of our building this is what it's going to cost this is how things will work I just still don't hear that but well, those are all questions that are going to need to be determined and, and vetted so this is just the beginning of the process so Mr. Brand over here is going to be the one that's going to take you to the next level of that conversation we're just getting the conversation started Anybody else? Well, I'm glad we had a number of board members here tonight, um, a number of you know other uh, district administrators. Thank you so much for coming out, taking out a couple hours of your time. Really appreciate the feedback. This information will be on the district's website, so you can refer back to it. There'll be, I believe, the recording uh, available, but you'll be able to find that as well. You can go back and look at the slides. Um, there's an opportunity to submit additional questions in that question box that, uh, that is provided on the district website. Um, a community survey coming out in the next week or two. Um, please tune into our upcoming board uh, meetings, Board of Education meetings. I'm sure this is going to be a conversation that the board is going to be uh, dialoguing around. Yes? How is that survey coming out? Is that going to be electronic? It'll be a telephone survey. So it's just random. You may, you know, you may or may not get a call. It's just random registered voters in the city of North Olmsted. So, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, good luck and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.